Revolutions Per Minute is a weekly radio show from the New York City chapter of the Democratic Socialists of America, recorded live at WBAI 99.5 in Brooklyn every Tuesday at 5. RPM is about doing the work, the work to build a democratic socialist future. Every week, hear the latest news, analysis, and organizing experience from the minds and hearts of activists fighting every day in NYC. Join the movement at socialists.nyc. Yo, it's good New York. I'm Jack Devine, and you're listening to Revolutions Per Minute on WBAI 99.5 FM. Revolutions Per Minute is a socialist radio show and podcast for members of the New York City Democratic Socialists of America. The Democratic Socialists of America is the largest socialist organization in the United States, with 56,000 members nationwide. Every two years, we have a national convention to decide important questions about the direction of our organization and vote for our 16-member National Political Committee, who serve, as a, who serve as our nationwide leadership. Last weekend, our special correspondent, Michael Carter, was down in Atlanta with our 1,056 delegates from around the country who met dem- to democratically decide upon these questions and meet their comrades from re- throughout the country and the world. In this episode, we hear from organizers and activists around the country, as well as from members of the New York City DSA delegation to the convention, about their experiences and about what it means to run an organization democratically. We have on-the-ground interviews with elected socialists Maryland House Rep. Gabriel Acevedo, Chicago City Council Member Byron Sigcho Lopez, Peekskill City Councilwoman Vanessa Agudelo, North Dakota State Legislature State Legislator Ruth Buffalo, Oregon School Board member Brandy Fortson, who is, uh, who is the first non-binary person elected to public office in the United States, and several delegates to the convention. We also spoke with delegates organizing for socialism in other spheres of struggle. We'll share with you their experience participating in organizational democracy in order to build a multiracial workers' democracy across the world. Last but not least, we will be hearing from newly elected National Political Committee member Tawny Tidwell. And for our podcast listeners, now the headlines. A police department administrative judge ruled that Officer Daniel Pantaleo should be fired for killing Eric Garner with an illegal chokehold. The ruling comes over five years after Garner's death. New York City immigration courts have the largest backlog of any city in the country. With 116,828 cases awaiting trial, judges face a quota of 700 cases per year. Additionally, translators are limited, meaning many asylum seekers must work with translators through the phone. Last Monday, Governor Cuomo signed a bill decriminalizing possession of small amounts of marijuana and creating a system to expunge the records of those with certain marijuana convictions. The legislation removes criminal penalties for possession of less than two ounces of marijuana. It reduces the penalty for possessing less than one ounce to a $50 fine and imposes a maximum $200 fine for possessing between one and two ounces. Despite advocates' efforts, the bill does not legalize marijuana. Selling the drug remains a felony and possession is still an arrestable offense, though it will not result in a criminal record. Following a recent increase in bicyclist fatalities and injuries, totaling 18 fatalities so far this year, Mayor de Blasio announced a new effort to encourage biking and build a safe cycling infrastructure in the city. Under the plan, the city will spend $58.4 million over the next five years on new bike lanes, redesigned intersections, and stepped-up enforcement. The cycling community has long criticized the de Blasio administration for lax enforcement on drivers and insufficient safety measures for cyclists, though some advocates are cautiously optimistic about the new plan. A recent report revealed that the majority of MTA board members are millionaires, and only five of the current 14 MTA board members live in New York City, despite the fact that 89% of MTA's ridership live in the five boroughs. Uber launches a helicopter service to New York City airports so the 1% doesn't have to deal with our crumbling transit infrastructure. And finally, the NLRB may make Scabby the Rat illegal. Go figure. In local election news, the Caban campaign was in Queens State Supreme Court to challenge the outcome of the Democratic primary for Queens District Attorney. A judge ruled he will only consider opening 28 ballots that have previously been thrown out. The Caban campaign plans to argue that more should be considered in the hope that a 60-vote deficit can be erased. 
Former council speaker Melissa Mark Viverito is rumored to be joining the 2020 race to succeed Jose Serrano in the Bronx's 15th congressional district. Finally, Representative Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez is mobilizing her district's immigrant population to participate in the 2020 census amid fears that an undercount will result in lost congressional seats. Our daily headlines are brought to you by The Thorn, an incredible weekly newsletter by NYC DSA Electoral Working Group, covering local politics and radical activism. Subscribe at thethorn.nyc. But... For our live listeners, we're going to do things a little bit differently today and open the phone lines throughout uh, our early segments. So if you have any questions about what the DSA is and how we make our decisions and how we emerge as this real force in politics, then please give us a call at 212-209-2877. That is 212-209-2877. So, you know, uh, before you ask, I'm just going to you know, start talking about what the DSA is. As I said before, Democratic Socialists of America is the largest socialist organization in the United States. And not just right now. It is the largest socialist organization in the United States since the Second World War. That means since the McCarthyism and the Red Scare purged leftists from this country, from positions of power, and at the real height of the labor movement in this country. So... We're seeing this new force emerge. So, Michael, like, why did you get involved in DSA, and like, what like drew you into the uh, movement to build socialism? So, um, it's a combination of life experience um, and the context that socialism provided me to understand the world around me. Um, so, I had learned about some of the concepts in college, you know, through the through. Academia. I took a Marxist theory course actually in senior year, but it seemed sort of like, um, like a moribund kind of tradition that was bound in academia and in books, and it didn't seem like at that time there was any organized force that was successfully utilizing these ideas, um, and you know it was taught by an old like '60s radical who was who was. <laughs> you know, mem- who had his memories and would talk about how it used to be and sort of we would talk about the theory and all of the sort of little uh, gradations of thought within socialism, but th- there wasn't this movement around it, or at least I didn't know of this movement around it um, until, honestly, until the Bernie Sanders campaign and the aftermath of that. Um, a lot of my comrades who I started I, I was actually employed as a field organizer for Bernie, um, and a lot of my comrades working with Bernie had heard of the DSA. Um, a lot of my volunteer comrades on that fight um, after Bernie joined the DSA, um, and so it, that was really my entrance into the world of like actually participating in socialist politics, um, explicitly socialist politics. I had been involved in worker struggles on campus before with a group called Student Worker Solidarity, um, but... Um, and a lot of the folks there identified as radicals or identified as socialists, but we very much felt like we were kind of this tiny cell in a huge hostile world, not like we had comrades throughout the country or throughout the world. Yeah, you f- it, it felt very isolating for a long time to identify yourself as a socialist or radical or a communist even. I mean, the latter is probably still a little uh, out of mainstream discourse for most people, but even imagining five years ago that socialism would be discussed so often that there would be a robust and powerful socialist organization in the United States as having a real impact in multiple spheres of politics, not just elect electorally, but really building power in the labor movement, in the anti-racist movement, um, in the climate justice movement, um, in a mo- uh, building a real movement for socialist feminism. It's it's just very encouraging. And I, I, I had a somewhat uh, similar pull into the movement. I started to really, um, I, I guess when I was like a teenager, I started to really doubt the kind of the legends and the myths that were propagated about American history. And I was always like growing up, I was like a history nerd. I was like always really into the stuff and I was, I was reading things. And then I started to like, like with the Iraq war and then the financial crisis, which, um, 
the latter happened when I was in high school, I started to think, wow, like everything I've been told that like, oh, we live in this like American dream and that we're this force for democracy and good. Uh, it doesn't really ring true. Uh, it seems to be no. made up a legend and that the world does not work the way that like uh, the masters of media propaganda like to tell it that, that we weren't these this heroic force that actually a lot of the wealth and the power um, and the and or just even the comfort of a lot of like suburban Americans was built on the blood and the exploitation of American slavery and native genocide and just constant class war waged against working people in this country and around the world. And then I started to see movements like Occupy, um, Black Lives Matter, uh, the indigenous struggles like at Standing Rock. And this all kind of coalesced like um, not like that the the movements like were explicitly what led to like the Bernie campaign. But the Bernie campaign was, I think, part of this kind of emerging struggles, this uh, not just like calling out capital as the enemy, but identifying what a, a real alternative, a real vision. And I think um, Bernie embracing that label of democratic socialism uh, led me to having a certain comfort about um like identifying myself in the way and then not even just that want to get pulled into a movement like wanting to build power in a real um way so since then i think and we're both part of this wave of people that have joined dsa which has existed since the 1980s but has dramatically transformed in that time mm. since that since 2016 um both after these struggles that we're talking about the bernie campaign and i think trump's election yeah. also led people to realize that like the the what we've been told is a farce that like if trump can be elected in this country that we're not just like move it that there's this force of reaction that we have to organize against and we have to organize for something new so like what are some examples and i th think there are some of these things that you've been heavily involved in that um dsa has done over the past few years to really transform itself and demonstrate that it's a real force in politics well the most visible are obviously elections um you know you have the election of alexandria ocasio cortez uh which i was privileged enough to be um, employed on that primary campaign uh, and kind of really just see that from the ground up, um, which was extraordinary. Uh, there is the election of Julius Salazar to the state Senate. There is the election of, um, there was a sort of segment at the convention of 19 democratic socialists from all around the country who had been elected um, from all different positions, from state legislature to county judge to you name it, you've got someone. Um, and <clears throat> these are folks who have an unapologetically radical vision, um, but, and are able to win sort of everywhere. I mean, uh, I was looking up for my mom, uh, the list of democratic socialists elected in Minnesota, my home state. And it's not, they're not in the Twin Cities. They're in Duluth and Moorhead. They're in, they're in out far flung areas. Um, you know, Lee Carter in Virginia, who managed to take out the whip of the Virginia House of Delegates, a uh, very powerful person. Um, but that's not all. That It's very important that folks realize that we're not just about elections. Um, they're just sort of, they're almost the icing on the cake or the cherry on top of the cake. Um, what is really transformative about what we're trying to do is the organizing that goes up to the elections. So I think the best example of that might be the housing legislation that we were able to pass in New York State this year, which was much stronger, much more pro-tenant than any of the landlords expected, than any of the political observers expected, than um, really anyone, even the left, even pe my comrades didn't expect us to get this much in this, in this law. Um, and the reason why that was able to happen is we had, um, in coalition with a, the upstate downstate housing coalition and groups all around the state tenants um, coming together forming tenant unions um, and the New York and the the housing working group of the New York City DSA sort of had a leadership role um, members of that were coordinating the coalition were sort of setting the demands for the coalition were thinking up the policy for the coalition in some cases um, and had a real long-term vision. I was involved with this working group starting in 2017, 
And right from the start in 2017, we were saying we need to organize around the rent laws in 2019. Um, that's when they're going to be renewed. That's the biggest issue facing our communities today. Um, and that's what we need to focus on. Um, and so that vision, that sense of, you know, the idea that it's not just owners who have rights, also just individuals, people, tenants, um, is really radical in the American context. Um, we've got a real, a real history of valorizing and encouraging home ownership. So the idea of organizing tenants, um, especially in our neoliberal um, environment right now, is is very deeply radical. And I don't think that that radical vision would have been part of what we passed if not for the um, involvement of DSA members as part of that coalition. Yeah, I think that's absolutely correct. Like building these tenant unions that are rooted in tenant power and the the power of everyday people in democratic organizing is so critical and crucial. And I think it's just one example of many working class institutions that DSA members have been working to both build or to radicalize existing ones like unions that had been stagnant and on the defensive for a while. And I want to get back after we roll this clip and talk about that develop the role DSA is playing in developing working class institutions more. But as you were just discussing, we have all of these um, elected officials officials. And they're obviously some of the most famous ones like Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez or Julia Salazar are here in New York City. And we've been doing great electoral work here. But we've won races all across the country. We've played a crucial role in really getting using these elected officials to really kind of make socialist ideas, ideals and conceptions into the mainstream and have real effects on legislation. Um, so we are going to roll to a go to a clip from Atlanta, which I was hoping to get a little Jermaine Dupree remix into the beginning, but you know we don't have the licensing rights for that here. Um, but we're going to roll down to Atlanta and hear from our uh, elected officials, who uh, some of our elected officials were talking about um, building socialism at the ballot box. Uh, capitalism has failed our planet, uh, and I think more and more people are coming to that realization. Uh, and recognizing that the only way for our long-term uh, survival is for us to not only envision an economy and a society uh, that is truly democratized, but also recognition that our basic needs are not commodities to be exploited for profit. And unfortunately, that has been the norm uh, since the inception of this country, whether it's the exploitation of enslaved African labor, whether it's the, the, the stealing of indigenous lands, a recognition that capitalism will not work for us. And really there are only two economic systems as I see it in this country and that is in this world is capitalism and socialism because they must all answer the fundamental question. Who is owning the means of production and who is benefiting from that? So democratic socialism, we believe in democratizing our communities and our economy and democracy is still an aspiration in this country and until we get there we're going to continue to fight we're going to continue to run as openly democratic socialists we're going to continue to demand better and we're going to work to dismantle capitalism my name is Victor lopez i am one of the democratic socialists one of the six democratic socialists elected in chicago and um, i'm glad to see at least four of my colleagues here today in the dsa convention um, I, I think that unequivocally, and just looking around the room, democratic socialism is on the rise. Uh, and it's on the rise despite the negative publicity, the the constant attacks uh, from Republicans and corporate Democrats alike, because it's the only movement that is talking about the real issues that we face in our country. Uh, you see from, from a democratic socialist elected in Knoxville, to, as an immigrant myself as well, who came here by 17 years old, and see the shameful attack on the immigrant community on a daily basis, children being caged, families being separated, children missing. The only group and the only alternative that we have to really come up with solutions that are structural. Medicare for All is one of the campaign that democratic socialists put at the front. Mm -hmm. And we are not afraid and not apologetic about what we're pushing forward. When we see students burdened by student debt, cannot, cannot have to share rooms in order to have shelter, poverty also reaches our college universities. This is the 
problem, it is a systemic problem, and we are talking clearly and boldly about this and what we can do about it. From healthcare to education to housing, this is the movement that is growing because we're talking truth to power. I am currently serving a four year term in the North Dakota legislature representing District 27, and it is an honor to be here, and I'm thankful to be here, and I'm very proud to be here because I represent the endless possibilities that could happen here in our great country of the United States of America. I believe that those closest to the pain need to be in power, for example, in elected office. But I also know that the wise man once said, you don't need to be in elected office to make a difference. And the power is definitely in the people, in our communities, and organizing as a collective. I stand here in solidarity with our shared values of of this country being founded and referred to as the land of the free, home of the brave, and justice for all. I stand in solidarity with immigrants, refugees, our relatives from the South who are seeking asylum here, and I also stand with our working class family. I'm Brandi Fordson. I'm a newly elected school board member in the Corvallis School District uh, 509J. Um, my official title is director in position number six. That's what I ran for. Um, and where is Corvallis? Corvallis is about an hour and a half south of Portland and a little bit west off I-5. In the state of Oregon? In the state of Oregon. It's okay. home of Oregon State University. So, um, I ran as openly socialist, queer, and non-binary. Um, so, that means my pronouns are they, them, and themselves. Um, and I get the privilege, even though I was unaware of it until very close to my election, to be the first openly non-binary person elected to public office in the United States of America. This means so much for representation for adolescents and adults alike, because it is such a crucial time. In 2019 alone, we've had 12 black trans women who have been slain and hate crimes against LBGTQ, LBGTQ+, and our community has risen exponentially over the last two years, and hate crimes are so underreported, even by people like me, who, at the rate that we receive them, sometimes it's not even worth mentioning it except to other folks in our community. The next four years of my term, because uh, school board terms in Oregon are four years, um, they're going to be full of policy procedural growth and just making space for other non-binary and trans umbrella folks who don't fall on the binary spectrum to simply exist. In a time where Oregon is 50th in mental health for both adolescents and adults, and the fact that we are also 49th in the country for foster care, we are actively failing kids. I come from, like, I'm, I'm deeply ingrained in the community. I uh, come from an activist background. I was part of the fight against the uh, Enbridge natural gas pipelines that were being built 105 feet away from uh, the oldest, or what was the oldest operating uh, nuclear power plant now being decommissioned at uh, Indian Point. And uh, I got involved with DSA really because of the Bernie Sanders campaign in 2016. Um, I did a lot of organizing in Peaksdale and the surrounding areas, um, all volunteer based, uh, but that really kind of laid the foundation for me to then be able to build uh, my campaign when I ran for office. And when he lost the primary um, in New York, I wasn't really sure what to do. Uh, there were a couple folks that were interested in building a DSA chapter and I, was, I ended up being one of the founding members. And Bernie always said that change happens from the bottom up and it was one of he's really one of the main reasons why I decided to run for local office. You're listening to Revolutions Per Minute on listener-sponsored WBAI in New York City, broadcasting at 99.5 FM and streaming on your favorite podcast app. To connect with us after the show, you can email us at revolutionsnyc at gmail.com or sign up for our newsletter to get links to what we talk about on the show. You can do that at our website, revolutionsperminute.simplecast.com. You can also find us on Twitter at NYCRPM. Today, we're talking about the Democratic Socialists of America's National Convention. Before we dip back into the convention itself and the broader struggles that DSA is engaged with both at the ballot box and to build working class institutions rooted in our communities, we want to talk about a working class institution that you're listening to right now, WBAI. WBAI is a community radio show 
I mean, not a show, station that really connects people to the news that you're not going to hear on corporate funded media. It's such a huge reason why the discourse in this country is so tilted to the right is because the media is owned by the same people whom you have to sell yourself to work 8, 10 to 12 hours a day. The same people that you have to give half of your wages in rent also own the media. The capitalist class does not want you to hear this sort of uh, content. They don't want to hear about so- you to hear about socialism, to really get in-depth conversations about building worker power, building tenant power, um, building anti-racist and feminist social movements that can really take on the entrenched ruling class in this country. So please, like, if you can, if you have the funds, Become a uh, like a sponsor of this, not just a sponsor of this radio station, a member of this radio station, because WBAI's leadership is democratically elected, and you can become part of the process. So, in order to do that, just give a call to the WBAI pledge number. That is five one six six two zero three six zero two. Again, that is five one six six two zero three six. Zero two, Or you can do it online. You can go to give to, that's the number, WBAI.org, give to WBAI.org, and become a member of the WBAI community. And if you want and if you want to really hear more content like this, talking about socialism, building worker power, connecting to the organizers on the ground, the movements that are happening now, tell them about how much you enjoy revolutions per minute and you want to hear more content like this because we're at this show where you know we're a collective and we're hoping to bring more of this content to wbai so if you can let them know that you're a fan we would really love your support um so getting back to uh the national convention and what dsa has been up to for the past couple uh years i think it's really critical to note uh as we've covered here on rpm uh, like all the work that people have been doing in uh, different areas of struggle, like you have immigrant justice, which has been um, both really focused on either getting ICE out of courts, um, which they weren't able to do at uh, in Albany, but they were able to force using direct action, getting petitions signed, organizing, force the, the courts to sign an order to get ICE out of the courts. Now, is that going to solve all the problems? No, but it's a step in the right direction and makes people aware of something another heinous action by the deportation terror apparatus. Or you had, uh, we just talked about the Queer Liberation March um, here on uh, RPM a a few weeks ago, where you had radicals really getting back to the tradition of queer liberation and not rainbow capitalism and organized a massive um, march on the same day as the corporate sponsored gay pride march where we had 45,000 radicals out in the street protesting against capitalism, empire, and racism all together in a united front of queer liberation. And then around the country, you have DSA members you know, engaged in um, building unions like out um, in San Francisco where you had Anchor um, Brewery, uh, you had the workers there organized, come together um, through uh, DSA and DSA built connections with the broader union movement to get those workers organized and bring them together. So that there's a lot of really, really exciting developments happening all across uh, the country right now because DSA is engaged in this, um, you know, organizing that is building worker power on the ground. So, um, Michael, I just, since you were there at the convention, uh, do you just want to like briefly explain how we make, uh, decisions collectively? Like what was your experience like being part of the process? It was really interesting, um, to be an observer in that room. Um, just because, it was really, there was a sense that it was serious business. Um, people were focused. People were intent on getting their priorities passed. People had their caucuses and their formations and their tendencies. People were walking around the floor trying to whip votes. People were, uh, you know, bringing forward motions from the floor. Um, it was really a situation where most political conventions or most political events, you sort of, the leadership will sort of decide what happens and then maybe you'll have a gathering to sort of like cement that or to create uh, 
the illusion of support for that or to, you know, get your folks excited about that. Um, but really, there was a sense that a lot was at stake here. People were really voting. People were really coming up with resolutions. And just so logistically, so folks can understand, um, each of the chapters around the country have a proportional number of delegates um, based on their number of dues paying members. Uh, New York City had around 100 delegates, which made it the largest chapter, um, the largest delegation. And all of them are voted on by their local chapters, at which point um, they're given information about two things, basically. Resolutions, which uh, set sort of priorities for the organization, um, and then uh, elections to the National Political Committee, which is a 16-member body that... Um, Basically, when there isn't convention, that, those are the folks that make national level decisions. Um, now, they are definitely like under the convention, the full body of the membership, if you're thinking about you know, how we control this organization on a national level. Um, but if you need to make a quick decision or a budgetary decision or something in between conventions, um, or if you need to implement the resolutions that are passed at convention, that's what the National Political Committee is for. Um, and we will be speaking with Tawny, who is a newly elected member of the National Political Committee, later in the episode. So stick around to hear that. It's going to be very exciting. And it was, you know, it was, it was, there was overwhelmingly young people. Um, and by young, I mean, you know, under 40, under 30. Uh, there was a person from the Japanese Social Democratic Party that complimented the audience and was remarking on how exciting it is that the left in in uh, in the United States is is so young. Um, we have the opportunity to really lead for future generations and to build a strong organization that will last into the future when we're not around anymore. Um, it was really awesome to see that international solidarity. We had folks from Germany. We had folks from the Philippines. Um, and we had people from Austria, which is not the same as Germany. Uh, and so it was a very, it was just like, it was there was a celebratory sense, but there was also a sense that this is about business. This is about real things. This is about um, setting the, the agenda for an organization that has a lot of promise right now and a lot of power. Yeah, I think what you highlighted there, which is uh, like really important and what makes DSA distinct from like a nonprofit organization, is that we are uh, reliant on our members and that we are run by our members and it's democratically run and controlled. So the power lies in the people who are here organizing, doing the work, that it's rooted in its membership. And there's also a balance of power between the national organization and the local chapters. Because the convention only happens every two years, people are also doing work on the day-to-day. -day. They're doing all this organizing that sometimes can seem invisible. There's a lot of administrative work that goes into organizing, and it's not – it's not all fun and games. Like it's not all just the marches where you can be loud. There's a lot of decisions that have to be made, and um, I think it's really important that in this process, uh, even though you know there are caucuses and everyone and there are people who have their differences ideologically, that we be really respectful of the people in the room and uh, take their concerns and consideration. And um, I think for the most part that happened, uh, there were maybe a few controversies that Fox News is trying to seize on <laughs> to divide us. And I think it's really important that we uh, show solidarity in this moment and don't fall into their attack and embrace the lines that they are using against our organization, that this is not something that normal people would want to do. I don't, uh, for my end, I don't know what normal person would go on Fox News. Um, but uh, let's now hear from the delegates themselves about their experience at the convention and what they're really excited about coming up in the next year. Decades of socialism being under attack kind of can make you feel that way mm -hmm. and make you feel like socialists are the only people you can talk to. And I think that's like really antithetical to what our project is about because our project is about reaching the largest number of people possible and training them, and bringing them into our movements, and giving them the ability to fight for themselves. So. That's why I joined DSA, and that's why every day I'm so proud to be a DSA member, because I see you know, 
all of the work we're doing across New York and nationally, that that's what that's what we're doing and changing in this country. Is people's sense of what they can do. Socialism is tough and we've never figured it out, but DSA is a group of people who may have different answers on how we get there, but agree that we need to figure it out together. I'm proud to be democratically deliberating what direction DSA should take for the next two years at this convention with all 1,100 of my comrades who are delegates here. At DSA's last convention, we voted to endorse Medicare for All, support organized labor, and fight for electing socialists. And since then, Medicare for All has become the top issue of the 2020 Democratic primary. The Teacher strike wave and other strikes have really revitalized organized labor in this country, thanks in part to DSA. And we're electing candidates like Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, and we're fighting for candidates like Heidi Sloan from Austin, an organic organizer with DSA. Well, so when it comes to resolutions, the implementation of that is left up to the National Political Committee. Um, and they're not necessarily binding. There's, there's flexibility for the NPC to kind of decide how they're implemented. Which, which, like, I think there's pros and cons to that. I mean, like, the pro is that there's each resolution comes with a certain need of money and resources, and we can't necessarily be able to do all of them, so it's good that there's a flexibility for the NPC to kind of be like, well, we don't have the resources to do this now, or maybe this is a little bit cheaper, so we can work on it that way. Um, constitutional amendments are binding. Um, but, I mean, I mean, I think you can see the impact that DSA has had based on resolutions that was passed at the prior prior convention and how things have shaped up in the last few years. So we passed Medicare for All as a priority campaign um, at the 2017 convention and it's been a huge campaign for a lot of chapters. Um, it's, it's a huge talking point on the presidential debates today and that's clearly not all because DSA. Like it's been a huge thing for Bernie Sanders who was talking about it before DSA like blew up in membership. Um, but I but I certainly think that DSA um, like keeps that conversation alive. Um, DSA also, uh, at the last convention, pushed electoral as a priority. Since then, we've helped um, elect Alexander Ocasio-Cortez, um, a lot of local candidates. Um, there are several DSA members that are on the city council now in Chicago. Um, so you can see the huge impact that the 2017 convention has had. Um, so I, I certainly think the things that we're doing at the convention this year, you know, in two years, we'll be talking about the impact of that. There's several that I've been following that I'm so grateful is pa that have passed, especially coming from Oregon, where fascism is so pre um, prevalent. Like, I'm so happy that uh, Resolution 9, like, passed, and we are now, like, officially, like, an anti-fascist organization like that. Is so amazing to hear when my life, my comrades' lives, my children's life has all been threatened by these people. You're listening to Revolutions Per Minute on listener-sponsored WBAI in New York City, broadcasting at 99.5 FM and streaming on your favorite podcast app. To connect with us after the show, you can email us at revolutionsnyc at gmail.com or sign up for our newsletter to get links to what we talk about on the show. You can do that on our website, revolutionsperminute.simplecast.com. You can also find us at NYCRPM on Twitter. Today, we're talking about the DS DSA's National Convention, and we are joined by a newly elected member of the National Political Committee. Tawny, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. Um, so before we dive in specifically to the NPC and uh, why you decided to run, um, like what motivated you to get involved in the struggle for socialism in the first place? Well, um, before I joined DSA, um, I had been an organizer in the reproductive justice movement for close to a decade. <laughs> so uh, I was involved in abortion fund organizing. I used to be on the board of a fund, and I had taken a couple of years off, uh, basically out of burnout. And when Hillary Clinton started running, I got very frustrated um, with the national political situation. And DSA was the first organization that I really felt like could be... Um, could really take off the way that it has and the popularity of socialism like really I never expected to see it in my lifetime so I joined pretty much immediately um, <laughs> around the election I think like a lot of people did in 2016 um, but I was in Texas then so it was a little different. I feel like that highlights like someone we were talking about before is like all the different ways that people got 
pulled in to DSA, like either like they were like disgruntled with politics or they saw something with like Occupy or Black Lives Matter or they were an organizer who had been looking for some like bigger picture thing. Like they'd been focused on an issue, but it seemed like there was like so much force in the direction of reaction. But to see like a socialist organization growing and powerful has really pulled like people into like this emerging movement. So like um, I guess you touched on it uh, already, but like why DSA and like what kind of work have you been engaged with in the organization? So I think that DSA is a really unique organization because it's such a big tent. Like I really believe in protecting the tent. Um, I know that we'll probably get into this later, but that's part of why I ran for the NPC. Like I think it's important to have a diversity of perspectives in the org represented um, nationally and in local chapters and things like that. Um, I think that DSA has a unique ability to radicalize people because it's friendly enough. It has Bernie Sanders all over it, um, which is great. Like, I'm very pro-Bernie. Um, but it gives people an opportunity to think that socialism is, you know, something like Medicare for all, and that's it. And then they sort of start reading more radical texts. They get into Marx. They start reading Rosa. Uh, and they start realizing, like, oh, we could actually do so much more. Like, a better world is possible. It doesn't just have to be these, like, legislative moves in the short term. In the long term, we actually might be able to, I don't know, abolish capitalism. So... Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, get, like what it's definitely like getting involved in DSA can be a, I mean, and this term I feel like is used as like an, in a negative sense, but it's a positive thing. Ra becoming radicalized, recognizing the deep roots of the problems and not just like recognizing it. Like I was very opposed to like capitalism and corporations and racism and empire, but seeing like the tactics and the strategies necessary to actually like overcome the forces of reaction and like building worker power that is like really rooted in our communities um so like it's so exciting to see that happen so um can you like explain why you i guess you just kind of gave an example of why you ran for the npc that you want to maintain the big tent but like what is the npc like what can you do on the npc and like what are some other reasons that you ran for it so one thing I'm really excited about um, being on the NPC is I really want to get involved in the chapter pipeline committee because um, the NPC basically can approve chapters and help them get set up in um, basically like I guess all the time. I don't the convention doesn't approve new chapters. Um, <laughs> so I'm just really excited to help people grow and like to support smaller chapters. Um, I was endorsed by the I'm hoping that they're not listening because I don't remember what the letters stand for. Uh, Rural, Suburban and Small Chapter uh, Caucus, I think uh, the RSSC, um, because coming from Texas, um, not that Houston is a small chapter, it is a metro area of five million people, but. <laughs> Only small if you're in New York. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, um, but I, I know a lot of people in smaller chapters and I recognize like the struggles with that. And so like as a person on the NPC, like I'm really hoping to be able to reach out to them and maintain like a good relationship with them and really help socialism grow in the places where reaction is likely to get strongest. Um, Aside from that, I'm just hoping to be a voice for like reproductive justice and queer politics um, on the committee and working with people to, you know, fight for the priorities that we voted for at convention, especially eco-socialism. Um, I realize I never answered your question about what work I did in DSA. Um, <laughs> I think I'm <laughs> I'm most well known in my favorite work I've ever done is um, when Hurricane Harvey hit Houston. I was a person that led teams that went out to um, like clear out people's homes of like flooded uh, floors and walls and take out their furniture and things like that and actually meet people in the community. And that work is just going to get more important and more frequent. So... Yeah, it was a uh like when we were going over like all this work that DSA has been doing and in my head I was like I have to mention like the incredible mutual aid work and it just completely slipped my mind so I'm <laughs> really happy that you brought up the great work that people are doing in Houston and they've done like with the also like the break light um, clinics that have happened all across the country which is both a mutual aid project and an anti-racist project to help people not get pulled over so like it, it kind of shows like how all these issues intersect like you can do mutual aid work that is anti-racist or is for building like mutual aid collectives to deal with the problems that climate change will unleash. So I think there's like, it is revealing like how much work um, DSA is doing, but also how much work there needs to be done as time goes on in the future. So um, like you've, you've already hinted at some of the resolutions that you, that passed um, that you found to be really important. Um, but is there Anything that like you think is particularly important for like building power over the next couple of years? Um, 
I'm really happy that we passed all the decolonization stuff. Um, I think that that's really important for showing people that we're serious about what we say we're serious about and bringing a framework that's not just nationalist to our politics. Um, and I also think that all the housing stuff that passed is really exciting. The labor priorities are going to be great. Um, I'm really excited about organizing the unorganized. Um, as a non-union worker who is trying to unionize her office, I hope my bosses don't listen to this show. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, it was exciting for me to see us say like, hey, we're not a union, like we have resources, let's use them in interesting ways and see what we can accomplish. So, um, yeah, no bosses allowed on RPM. That's the only <laughs> people we discriminate against. <laughs> um, so Certainly not bosses of people who are on the show. <laughs> <laughs> Please, no. I, I mean, you're, I guess your boss is all right. We'll uh, we'll let that slide. <laughs> She's good. You know, we helped the elector. <laughs> um, so uh, we just want to open up uh, the phone lines and you know get your questions about uh, DSA, the National Convention, um, where you would like to see DSA or organizing over the next couple of years, uh, if you're curious about like um, how the organization works, uh, you know, we're open books here. We, we want to hear from you. Um, so please uh, give WBAI a call at 212-209-2877. That's 212-209-2877. So uh, another um, kind of, I guess, I would say like ideological resolution that I was really encouraged with um, that passed was the Open Borders Resolution, which was mm. also something that we passed here in New York and we covered on the show uh, like a couple months back. And I think just as you were saying with the um, like anti-colonization um, legislation that it's it really highlights the way that uh, the DSA needs to be an internationalist organization. Um, so is there anything like um, while you're on the MPC that you can do to like really make sure that this is a focus for DSA? I know that's a tough question. <laughs> <laughs> that's a really good question. Yes, we'll make sure to open all the borders. Um, <laughs> no, uh, Just uh, wire cutters on the fences. <laughs> right. Um, I think that that is – a question that is a little bit difficult to answer because I haven't gotten into um, like I missed the orientation meeting for the NPC because I was on a plane home. Um, we I, have lives. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, I actually found out in the TSA line that I was elected, so oh. it was interesting. Um, but I do think that there's going to be ways for us to prior prioritize immigrant justice work um, as an NPC. I mean, I know that um, Christian Hernandez, uh, who's from North Texas DSA, was also elected, and Blanca Estevez, and they've both been involved in a lot of that work. So. So rather than um, say that I know what we should do, I'm going to say that they are probably going to be the experts on that stuff and that I'm going to be like, I'll take your lead and we'll do it. Um, yeah. So I hope that there's a way for us to support particularly like um, work along the border, um, abolish ice type work, but also with people uh, with groups like no more deaths, like just it's probably going to be mostly support work for the DSA, but I think that's fine. Yeah, we had a like uh, one of our first episodes. We talked with a few comrades who went down to the border and did some basically like uh, mutual aid work with this like anarchist collective that is helping um, all these migrants that are fleeing this horrific violence that it was induced by the United States in the first place in Central America. And it's just it was really encouraging to hear you know and to see the solidarity of people down there uh, but it's also like it again reveals all the work that needs to be done and we have a caller on the line hey you are live on revolutions per minute what's your name and what's your question or comment hi charles richard zarelli and i hope everyone is well as well as the very beautiful bai public um my question is i showed up at the pierpont church and when you were having a dsa meeting and I'm looking to start a new independent party, and I wasn't sure how to interpret what I encountered. Um, I'm not going to mention anyone's name, but the gentleman's name started with A.B., and when I encountered him, he kind of led me to believe I shouldn't be there, and it wasn't going to help me at all. And So how does the DSA help anyone that I've emailed since May 31st trying to get a response? And I've not gotten no responses from the DSA, nor do I understand how I can receive help from you. How would I go about this? Well, if you're attempting to build, if your goal is attempting to build an independent party, I would say that you should instead evaluate what goals you're hoping for that party to achieve. Um, we're not, yeah. 
I was going to say I'm very confident of what I'm looking to achieve, and it definitely is up the area of what I saw and was interesting co- coincidentally while I was there. Resolution 31, which you're looking to adopt, would definitely be relative to being um, more having an independent, freer, open America, um, having much more of a balance. Um, and the people who are progressive, I want to say, would be relative to what I would see as well. Only I'm looking in a completely comprehensive ability, not just 5 or 10 or 15 or 20 items. It wouldn't be enough when I see what I need it to be worth, and not just myself, but all of America. Um, well, I, I want to th- like thank you very much um, for the call. Just to add one point, uh, I think what we're trying to do here in DSA is recognize like the real challenges to building an independent party, spe- especially one that's like specifically oriented around electoral politics. Like the Green yeah. Party has tried that for a very long time, um, and they've had a few successes, but let's be honest, mostly failure. Um, and to really build a political party, you need to build a social base. You need institutions that can back that party. And until we can have a, a labor movement in this country that is both organizes the unorganized, which is the vast majority of American workers, as well as um, the existing unions become more radically democratic, more participatory in struggle, and then you and also until we really build up the tenants movement. And build up all these in these all these other sites of struggle. Build these um, anti-racist working class institutions that are rooted in socialism and in expressing the, the the power of the people. There, I think focusing solely on building that independent political party is is something that just can't be achieved. It has to be in congruence with building of movement and building institutional power. Basically, you've got the cart before the horse. And, and, I, and that's not to say that we don't support Green Party candidates, third party candidates, or whatever party you end up founding. Um, my first sort of DSA electoral campaign was with Jabari Brisport, who was a Green Party candidate for city council. And that candidacy arose ultimately out of the housing organizing that I was referencing earlier. Um, so there's a lot of groundwork to do before we can, you know, create whatever party I'm interested to hear what the name is uh, that you're interested in forming. Um, we have another caller live on WBI. You're live on Revolutions Per Minute. What's your name? What's your question or comment? My name is Zabby, and I'm calling from uh, Suffolk County, the town of Brookhaven. And I just uh, wanted to uh, say that I have uh, become aware of another political philosophy within the socialist movement, and that is libertarian socialism, which is a set of anti-authoritarian political philosophies within the socialist movement, which rejects the conception of socialism as a form where the state retains centralized control of the economy. Libertarian socialists in the early 21st century have been involved in the anti-globalization movement, the squatter movement, info shops, social centers, anti-poverty groups such as Food Not Bombs, tenants unions, housing cooperatives, intentional communities, egalitarian communities, anti-sexist organizing, grassroots media initiatives, digital media, and computer activism, experiments in participatory economics, anti-racist, anti-fascist groups like anti-racist action and anti-fascist action, activist groups protecting the rights of immigrants and promoting the free movement of people such as the No Border Network, worker uh, cooperatives they support countercultural and artist groups, and the peace movement. Libertarian socialism has been more recently, has most, has also more recently played a large part in the global Occupy movement, in particular its focus on direct participatory democracy. Absolutely. Yeah, we actually, in the Democratic Socialists of America, have a Libertarian Socialist Caucus who, if, uh, and someone can correct me if I'm wrong, I believe one of their representatives, if not two, 
um, were elected to the National Political Committee. So DSA is absolutely a space where we welcome um, libertarian socialists. And I think there's a lot to learn from that movement within within the broader socialist movement and from uh, both the intellectuals, uh, more importantly, the struggles that uh, libertarian socialists or anarcho-syndicalists, um, there's a lot of different names I think you could call it. Uh, I always get a little heebie-jeebie around the word libertarian. It makes me think of someone in uh, like uh, a business school uh, with like re- like you know wearing a suit or something. You know, it's, it it, bring, it you know brings up uh, bad images in my mind. But I I definitely um, very much share a lot of the principles of um, kind of a decentralized. Um, grassroots power that the uh, movement represents and i think there's a lot of exciting historical struggles like especially like barcelona the civil war uh, you have a rojava also right now there's a there's a lot of uh there's a lot of history there and there's a lot of exciting struggles happening now so thank you very much for the call uh do we have an uh, uh, all right. Uh, it looks like we're going to have to wrap up this episode. But uh, just quickly before we do, uh, is there any th- um, sort of events uh, that you would really want to highlight people to get involved in or like uh, meetings that people could attend? If you don't have anything off the top of the head, your head is completely all right. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I've been so involved in convention. I have no idea where I live. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I would recommend that our last caller uh, go to um, – the Libertarian Socialist Caucus website uh, and try to sign up to get their um, updates. And if you're interested in moving our organization in a libertarian socialist direction, then get involved with your local chapter. I don't know exactly where your town is, but uh, I know there's both like a North Jersey chapter and a South Jersey chapter. And uh, a lot of the activity does happen remote, so you don't necessarily even need to travel to get there. Uh, and I think that is a perfect way to wrap up. Sorry to any of the other callers we had. We would love to take your questions, but just reach out to us on Twitter or uh, email us. We're happy to talk with you um, when we're not on the show. Well, and we're going to be back live on WBI next week. You've been listening to Revolutions Per Minute on listener sponsor WBI in New York City, broadcasting in 99.5 FM. Thank you for joining us, and we'll see you again or – well, uh, you'll hear from us again next Tuesday at 5 p.m. You're in our imagination. <laughs>